good and your mercy endures forever. You are good and your love reigns down forever. You are good and your mercy endureth forever. You are good and your love reigns down forever.
lift my hands lifted high oh god the battle belongs to you and every fear i lay at your feet i'll sing through the night oh god the battle belongs to you Yeah. 
scars and struggles on the way but with joy our hearts can say never once did we ever walk alone i'm carried by your constant grace held within your perfect peace never
And Lord, our nation needs you more than ever. You are on the throne. So we cry, holy, holy, holy. And we cry, come, Lord Jesus, Maranatha, set things right. Lord, there will be a government that will be perfect. And you're going to bring it. So, Lord, I pray that you would come soon. And tell them, Lord, I pray we'd be about the work of the kingdom, Lord. We would move forward in your power to bring your kingdom here on earth. Lord, I pray that we wouldn't just know the Lord's prayer in the back of our minds. We would live it out in prayer and in action. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, we need you. So, Lord, show up here in this church, Lord, in every church in this community that worships your name. And Lord, I pray you'd show up in places where they don't and show them who you are. Draw people to you. Draw us to you. We choose to worship in praise, in prayer, and in your word, Lord, and with our lives. So we give all to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can have a seat. If you want to stand, it's okay. I, I, I say that. I'm serious. Um, we, uh, we are going to jump into the passage in just a second. If you will, I see the, the youth filing out. It's good to have you in here for worship. I am going to invite you to turn in your Bible to Exodus chapter 33. Exodus chapter 33. We didn't finish it. You may have during the week. I did, but I didn't finish it last week on Sunday morning. We'll be jumping in at verse 12. A couple of quick announcements before I forget to do announcements. Number one, um, somebody said they were watching online and they thought there was something wrong with their screen. Like, you know, it was like um, breaking up at the bottom. No, those are Bibles. And we are encouraging every single person in here to come and take one, two, Ten. We'll get more if you're really going to use them. If you're taking them to stockpile, um, don't do it. Um, but there are time to revive Bibles. And if you've never used one, I would encourage you to check them out. They're really cool. So the bracelet and the colors walks through the Roman road, basically, with a few other scriptures in there, the, the gospel. And so you uh, use that bracelet, you wear it, and, and people ask you about it. You give it to them. But the Bible is color-coded. So if you've never gone through the training um, you're missing out. It's really cool. It's a simple way to present the gospel. And you have them read the scriptures. And if I turn to one of the scriptures, which they're like thumb tabbed, super easy, it's highlighted. Like it's, it's opposite. It's in contrast. You know, right? When you just have them read it, it walks them right through the gospel. So that's what those are. We want you to use them. So don't take them because they're pretty. Take them because you're going to use them uh, and uh, encourage you to do that. Um, if you are a part of the church and um, you have given to the work of the Lord through Ridgeview in the last year, 2020. The giving statements are available out there. I don't know how much stamps cost. Somebody told me 56 cents. Is that right? Somebody has to know. Nobody mails anything anymore. Is it 56? It saves us 56 times hundreds. So um, if you're here, if you're watching online, obviously it doesn't work out. You can come by if you're comfortable doing that. But pick up those giving statements. Uh, they're out at the little counter out there. Uh, there are a bunch of tables out there still for groups. If you're not in a group, we encourage you to be in a group, in a class or a small group. Um, there's connect groups. There's a launch pad if you're new and you don't know anybody and you want to get in a connect group. There's information out there. There are two classes starting today, financial, or starting Wednesday, I'm sorry, this week, financial peace and marriage on the rock. Um, those two classes are starting up this week. And there are two classes, I believe, starting up today, right now, they're going on. So uh, if you're in those classes, um, you should be there right now. Uh, but you're welcome in here as well. Um, Women's Retreat, February 26th or 28th. I encourage you to be a part of that if you are a woman. Um, and uh, if you are struggling to find the resources to go, and that's the only reason you're not going, let us know. Um, we never want that to be the only reason you can't go. So um, please let us know if that's the reason. Uh, but we'd love to have any women that want to go. You can still sign up. It's at the end of next month, so don't wait too long. Somebody asked me about the Israel trip. We had several people signed up. We have postponed it until September. So um, if you gave us money and you want the money back, 
we will give it to you if you want to just save it for September. Um, it, the travel, you can go to Israel right now, but it's, it's pretty limiting. And so I just didn't want anyone who goes uh, to Israel to be limited in where we can go and have things get shut down, which is a possibility right now. So uh, September 20th through the 30th, put that on your calendar. If you want to go to Jordan uh, to see Petra, we're going to, if we get enough people, we'll go do that as well. That'll add on a two or three extra days into the beginning of October. So mark that down. Exodus 33. Um, we are going to jump back into this passage. I gave you the title last week. That's the title this week because I didn't finish it. And that is, are you ready for revival? And, and I ask it as a question, not rhetorical. Are you? Anybody? I got one person and I got five people ready for revival. Are you ready for revival? Because if you're not, then when it comes, you're going to miss it. I'm serious. I use the illustration of surfing. I don't surf, but I watched it a lot. My brothers do it. And you don't bring the wave, but you have to be in position when the wave comes. We talked about that. Are you ready for revival? And if we are, we have to do the things that prepare us for revival. And I was drawing some of those things out of the passage in Exodus 33. God says, I'm going to take you up into the promised land. He, he really says this because it's a big distinction. He says, go up to the promised land. Go up. But it's a test because he says, I'm going to send my angel before you, but I'm not going. And I, I challenged us, and I was challenged. I mean, one cool thing about teaching, and there's some teachers in here, some pastors and preachers in here, and people that teach small groups. When you teach, you have to chew it and digest it and process it for a long time. And sometimes it messes you up. Amen? Sometimes it messes you up in a good way. It messes up your flesh. I was challenged by this fact. Would I be okay if God keeps all his promises and he sends me in to the promised land, but I don't get all of him? And I think sometimes the church has settled for something less than what God wants to give. Because God wants us to not just seek and receive his blessing, blessing from God. He wants us to receive the blessing of God, his presence. Do you want revival? Do you want more of God? Because if you do, we talked about the first two things. You have to humble yourself. They had to humble themselves. They mourned when they realized God said, you're going up to the promised land, but I'm not going. They were contrite. They took off all their adornments. They stripped themselves of those things from Egypt. Some of them were probably idols. They stripped themselves of them. And then they separated themselves in worship and prayer. Moses pitched his tent outside the camp. Why outside the camp? Why didn't he just pitch it right in the middle of the camp? Yeah, because he was separating himself, true worship, from sin. Let me warn you in something. If you are worshiping, quote unquote worshiping, with all your heart, you would say, and all of your gusto, and you're not separating yourself from sin, it's not genuine worship. Why? Because worship is surrender to God being a living sacrifice. Now, I'm not saying any of us will be perfect. What I'm saying is this. We have to choose to set ourselves apart. God's people were always told to be set apart. There's always a remnant. There's always a remnant because those people that are set apart are those who are truly worshiping. I take that very seriously. I've had conversations with different people over the years. Before I ever stand up here, there are days of me preparing myself, not with notes, but preparing myself spiritually, making sure that there is nothing that would get in the way. Here's the good thing. I preach a lot of Sundays, so it pretty much has become a lifestyle of saying, God, where there's anything in me that gets in the way, remove it. We have to be set apart. The people who truly wanted to worship, who truly wanted to encounter God in revival, set themselves apart, and they went and they worshiped where? What did it say in the passage? Outside the camp. They went to the tent of meeting to worship. This was not the tabernacle. It wasn't built yet. But this is where they went to worship. Set apart in worship. We're going to pick up in verse 12. Not just set apart in worship and prayer. Not just repenting, but pursuing his presence and his glory. Pursuing his presence and his glory. We talk about pursuing God's presence. I think a lot of times we stop short of what he really wants. Verse 12, Exodus 33. 
you got a Bible, follow along, it's good. The best part is the last part, but this part is really good too. Then Moses said to the Lord, see you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found grace in my sight. You're going to see that word grace show up a bunch of times in a row. Let me just tell you something. Some people say there's the Old Testament and the New Testament, the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. There's one God and there's one scripture. And grace is all over the Hebrew scriptures. It's right here. It's the only way we approach God is by grace. This side of the fall. It's the only way. Standing on the rock, we'll get to it. And that rock is Jesus Christ. Now, therefore, I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way, that I may know you and that I may find grace in your sight. And consider that this nation, I love how Moses does, is your people. Sometimes God says they're your people, Moses. Sometimes Moses says back, no, God, they're your people. They were your people before they were my people. Because there was no people until you made them a people. And he said, check this out. It's so awesome. This is when prayer gets answered. He says, my presence will go with you. And I will give you rest. Then he said to him, if your presence does not go with us, Moses says, do not bring us up from here. See, I fear that a lot of churches and we at times settle for saying, God, if you don't go up, it's okay as long as you give me everything you promised. It's kind of like we give God the Heisman, right? You know, it's like, I, I got the ball now. I'll, I'll just take it from here, God. Moses says, I'm not going. We're not going. I think there were probably people, if anyone was nearby when he was having this conversation, Joshua was there, that are thinking, are you sure you want to say that? If you're not going, because God wanted to kill them, remember. All of them. He wanted to destroy them because of their sin with the golden calf. If you're not going, we're not going. For how then will it be known, he says, that your people, and I have found grace, again grace, in your sight, except you go with us. In fact, he says, there's no point in going if you don't go. So we shall be separate, your people and I, from all the people who are on the face of the earth. The problem I mentioned the last time with the church in the United States today is that the church is not set apart. Because the church chooses to be set apart, we will stand out and people will know there's something different. I told some of you before, I worked as a chaplain, I'll mention it later, and uh, I worked with a lot of different people. There was a woman who was Muslim who was on the chaplain staff at, at UCLA. Uh, it's a liberal place. And there was a uh, Jewish rabbi. There was a, uh, a female rabbi. I mean, I, I didn't even know there were female rabbis until I worked there, but there are. And, uh, but this particular Muslim woman, she would often challenge me in, in how well I knew Scripture because they know their scripture. They're living in deception, but they know what it says. We need to know God, we need to pursue him, we need to know the truth. We can't settle for just a little bit of warm fuzzies with God. We have to desire his presence and his glory more than anything else. If you desire a nicer car more than you desire God's presence, you may get a, a nicer car. You may even say, I want to have this relationship with my spouse, if you're married, that's deeper than any other relationship. Don't say that before your relationship with God, because if you get it, you'll still be lacking. It has to be more than anything else, even good things, that you desire him. Too many times we settle for something less. We want the, the Midas touch of God. God, touch this, turn it to gold. You know, bless me, God. I want your blessing. We're not truly pursuing him. We're pursuing his stuff. We want healing and prosperity more than we want the very presence of God. Let me tell you something. Healing and blessing flow out of the presence of God. But if you pursue those things, you'll miss it altogether. What if, I wrote this down in my notes, and I didn't want to skip it. I skipped it in the first service. What if you 
got everything you wanted. Everything you wanted. Health, prosperity, success, power. But you didn't have an intimate relationship with the Lord. Would that be good enough? I hope not. But I fear in our country it's good enough for a lot of people. What if you gave God everything? Like you surrendered your life and you gave him your whole life and then you still had sickness in your body. Or you, you still struggled financially. Would God be enough? The Shekinah glory, the glory that Moses is about to ask for, the Chabod, if I say it right, I'll spit on the first row, so I'm just kind of holding back. Chabod, Chabod, the weightiness of God, the glory, the Shekinah glory. Shekinah is not in Scripture, but the idea is right here. The Shekinah glory, I mean, the actual word's not there. The presence of God shows up all the time. The weight of God's glory showed up. Here's our problem. We want sometimes spiritual goosebumps and warm fuzzies. Like, I just want to feel God's presence. Let me tell you something. That is not the Shekinah glory of God. Because when the Shekinah glory of God shows up, you are overwhelmed. What did I read earlier, if you were here at the very beginning? Isaiah 6. What did Isaiah say when he had an encounter with the, with the living Lord? Woe is me. I'm undone. What happened to John in the book of Revelation when he came into the presence of the Lord? He fell as if dead. Why? Because he couldn't stand. It wasn't like he decided to fall out at that moment. No, he just fell. He was overwhelmed by God. When God's power shows up, it isn't like, oh, I just, I just feel it right now. You know, that's okay. I, I love to experience you know, spiritual goosebumps or whatever, but that's not the, the presence of the Lord. That's an emotional response, a, a, a physical response to the power of God. But when God really shows up, he changes you. Because let me tell you something, I went to a lot of churches where a lot of people had experiences of God every Sunday, but they didn't change. Then you haven't really experienced the Shekinah power glory of, of God. Because it'll change you forever forever. And every time he shows up, even more. John the Baptist says, he must, what? Increase. I must decrease. That's why we don't have more of God in the church in the United States, because we want more of us than we need of him. We, we won't decrease enough to get more increase of him. If you will surrender your life to him, let me tell you something. I said it last week, and I'll say it again at least a couple of times. You are as close to God as you want to be. But you know how you get really close to God? Surrender your life. Die. Spiritually. Daily. Moment by moment. I'm like, well, I don't want to die. Moses says, if you're not going up, we're not going. And then Moses does something that, I don't know about you, but it strikes me as crazy. He says, God, God answered and says, I'm going. I'm going to take you up. And Moses says, I want more. If, if you, I just want you to think about this personally. Say you're having this conversation with God. You know, I don't know how many times you've heard his audible voice. Not a common thing. And God says, you say to God, God, we're not going up in the promised land unless you go. And you beg and you beg because God says he's going to destroy all the people and he's going to burn them up and he's angry. I can't go. If I go on the way, I might burn them up on the, on the path there. And then God says, okay, I'll go. You say, God, I want more. I'd be a little scared to ask that question. He's like, I'll give you more. You know, here he goes. I want more, he says. Here's another question I want to ask you. I want you to chew on this. I, I, it's not rhetorical. Do you, are you pursuing God passionately in your, in your walk? Are you passionately pursuing God? I'm looking for some sort of nonverbal or verbal. Are you? So here's my question. How? Because a lot of people, I see somebody give me like hand signs, praying. That's good. Pray, worship, praise, read his word. Because a lot of people tell me, I want to pursue God more passionately. I'm like, well, how much time do you give him each day? And they're like, oh, sometimes I don't. 
Like, like if you just put a Bible on your dresser and you lay your hand on it when you sleep, it'll just come through. <laughs> Bible study by osmosis, you know, diffusion through a membrane. I'm just going to just get it that way. No, you have to pursue him in action. You have to actually want more of him. Moses is serious. He puts a tent up. He goes out there. He pursues God. He's, in, he's got issues, but he's intense in pursuing God. He won't take the deal of just getting the promised land. Even God's presence, he says, I want more. We have two dogs. I talk about them all the time. One of them, Sparkle, she's, she's special. She really is. Um, we took her to two trainers. They both said, medicate her. And I'm not joking. They, we took her to a, a trainer who hunt, a trained hunting dogs. He, he, he wouldn't even finish the first session. He's like, your dog, I'm not working with. I mean, we offered to pay, right? This wasn't like a pastor freebie. He just, he's like, I'm done. You know, you can have the dog back. And then we took it to another type of trainer and they did one session. They actually did two. And they said, well, I suggest you use Benadryl or something to subdue the dog. The dog has issues. But I'll tell you one thing about my dog. My, my dog may not be the smartest dog, but my dog is the most loving dog you're ever going to meet. And here's the thing. My dog, when it wants your attention, will not settle for anything less than full attention. Because this is what my dog does. And some of you, how many of you have dogs? So I know who I'm talking to. Okay, I have a lot of people with dogs. Some of you will identify with this because I've had a bunch of dogs in my lifetime. My dog, when I'm sitting, like sitting on the couch, sitting anywhere, and my hand is here, my dog will come and put her nose under my hand and not just lift it up. My dog does this. And then if you don't pet the dog, the dog will start moving to get attention. We had a, a woman in our church uh, come over to hang out with my wife, and she loves dogs. We started petting our dog. Two and a half hours later, the whole time they were talking, the dog won't leave. When you talk about someone hounding you, my dog hounds me. That's why it's called hounding. They fo the dog follows me everywhere, and she does this, and she gets up under She jumps in my bed. My dog's not allowed in the bed, but she finds me because when I'm asleep, I can't say no. How many of you pursue God like that? Or like, well, I, you know, I had a little time with God this morning. Or do you come in close to God and say, I am not leaving. <laughs> Here's the thing, God's not like me. God's not like, enough, get out of here. No, he's like, stay here. Because we can say we're pursuing God's presence, but let me tell you something. If you, I'm gonna take a video one day for those, and, and you, I'm gonna show you how my dog is, and we'll all be challenged to pursue God like that. We are all as close to God as we want to be. Last part of this passage is the best. Standing in the refuge of the rock. Standing in the refuge of the rock. Verse 17. It, this is intense. It's crazy. It's powerful. And we can have experience of God that parallels this. So the Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing that you have spoken, for you have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. And he said, Moses, please Show me your glory. I want more. Then he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you. Do you know how awesome that is? God says, I'm gonna make all my goodness pass before you. There is nothing else but goodness in God. All is goodness. And he tells him exactly how to do it. It's very specific. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be, watch the word again, gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face. For no man shall see me and live. Why? Why? He's holy. There's only two people. This side of heaven. Well, that we know of that have seen God face to face. Adam and Eve. Why? Because they were holy. They were perfect. They had no sin before the fall. And they walked with God. And they saw him face to face. Since the fall, there is only one way. We will ultimately be there. But here on earth, we will never see him face to face and live. Sometimes people say, oh, I want to see God face to face. We sing these songs, seeing God face to face. I hope you're talking about heaven because you'll be dead. 
Then you'll be in heaven, I guess. But you, it's the only way. Here's the cool thing. God always finishes what he starts. There will come a day where we'll be like Adam and Eve, walking with God face to face. Do you long for that day? I do. If you don't, you don't know how good it's going to be. If you're not praying Maranatha, you don't know how good it's going to be. You don't know how bad things are getting. Verse 21. And the Lord said, here is a place by me. Watch this. Very important to understand the details here. And you shall stand on the rock. So it shall be while my glory passes by that I will put you. He says, don't say, doesn't say go get in there. He says, I will stand on the rock. Then I will put you in the cleft of the rock. What's a cleft? A crack, crevice, opening. Split. And I will cover you with my hand while I pass by. So the whole time God's passing by, he keeps his hand there, but watch this. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back. My afterglow. Wake. It's all Moses could handle. But my face shall not be seen. Moses wouldn't stop. He's like my dog. He said, God, I want more. Show me your glory. Show me your chabod. Show me your chabod. I want, to, I want the weight of your glory. He had already encountered God. He saw a burning bush. He saw a pillar of fire. He saw the Red Sea parted. He encountered God for 40 days on Mount Sinai. He says, I want more. Why does he want more? Because here's the thing I'm going to tell you, and some of you know it. The more you know God, the more you want to know God. If you don't want any more of God, it's because you don't know him that well. You are as close to God as you want to be. It's not because we make God come close. It's because if you're a believer, where is he? By his spirit, he's in you. You can't get any closer. Moses says, I want more. Not more stuff, not more signs. He says, I want more of you. Show me your glory. I, I'm given this scripture in the, a paraphrase, the New Living Translation or paraphrase, because I love the way it's worded here. It says, because I am righteous, I will see you. When I awake, I will see you face to face and be satisfied. I pray you're never satisfied until you're face to face with the Lord. If you really say you want to pursue him, then do it. That's what God's been saying to me the last two weeks. If you only want more of me, do it. See what I'll do. Surrender, decrease, Matt, and I'll give you more of me. It's going to cost us, <laughs> but the payoff the presence of God, the glory of God. God says, yes, it's all based on his grace. He says, you're going to see me, my back, ultimately. He says, I want to see your face. God says, no, no I'm going to show you grace. I won't do that because you'd be dead. You want to know what happens if you saw God face to face? Go watch Raiders of the Lost Ark. They show you. He says, I, I want you to do what first? He says, stand on the rock. I found that so fascinating. Stand on the rock. Paul says, and I believe it's, it's accurate in the, in the hymn that we're going to sing part of in just a minute. He says, stand on the rock. Paul says, and the rock that followed them was Jesus Christ. I do believe this is the same place where Elijah encountered the Lord. It's Mount Horeb, the mountain of God, Mount Sinai, same place. And I believe it happened at the exact same place. And I think that's interesting because where else do those two show up on the Mount of Transfiguration? Moses asked for more of God. He gets to see his back. But in Luke 9, he gets even more. Because he's there when Jesus starts glowing. But again, if the full glory happened, they, they got a glimpse. Because if they got more, Raiders of the Lost Ark, right, right all over again. The afterglow of God. He says, stand on the rock. And then he carries him. He carries him into the cleft of the rock. Do you see how cool that is? 
he, he's standing on the rock, but he has to be in the rock to survive. Jesus, cleft means to split or to be split. Jesus' back was split open for you and me. He, he was pierced in his wrists, in his, in his feet. He was pierced in his side. He was cleft so that we can be not just on the rock, but hidden in the rock. So that we can experience the power of the presence of God. Because one day, he's going to move his hand away and we're going to see him face to face. But only by grace. Only in the covering of Jesus Christ. Moses sees the afterglow, the wake of God. So if no one can, can see God, what about that song we sung earlier? When Isaiah said, I saw the Lord, what did he see? I'll tell you what I think. I think he saw Jesus Christ. Just like Joshua, before they went over to battle Jericho, the commander of the army of the Lord, just like Jacob, when he wrestled with the angel of the Lord, encountered Jesus Christ. Let me show you in scripture. No one has seen God at any time, at any time. The only begotten son who is in the bosom of the father, he has declared him. Who alone has immortality, jump into 1 Timothy 6, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. Sometimes we get a glimpse of God. Anybody in here ever had a glimpse of God? Anybody? Yeah. No, I'm not trying to, it's not a trick question. Sometimes we get a glimpse of God's power. Sometimes you feel his presence. Sometimes you hear his voice so clearly, you know it's him. You know it's him. One day, face to face, no separation, no covering. Adam and Eve, when they were in the garden, what were they wearing before the fall? Nothing. They were naked and unashamed. Why? Because they had the covering of God. When they sinned, they were ashamed. And then what did God do? Sacrifice. He covered them. There is only one way we get into the presence of the Lord, and that is by the covering of sacrifice, the covering of Jesus Christ. Revival. That's where we started. Are you ready for revival? When we talk about revival, I'm afraid we talk about the wrong thing. Revival is not us experiencing. It is these things, but not primarily. Revival is not ultimately experiencing the sense of God's presence. Revival is not ultimately the church growing, or being equipped even to do good things for God. That's not revival. You're like, well, I thought that was revival. We had all those tent meetings and everything in my church. That's revival, right? No. Revival is when the kabod of God, the Shekinah glory of God shows up. Because when God shows up and we invite him and then let him do what he wants to do, he changes everything, everything. If you've really experienced the power of God, the Shekinah glory of God, you are changed. Moses glowed being in the presence of God. I don't know what he looked like after he saw the back of God here, but God shows up in the weight of his glory, overwhelmed by his goodness. But some of you say, and we're almost done, but some of you say in your mind, I'm, I'm reading some of your minds, not really, but I bet I'm gonna hit it some of you. Some of you are thinking, this is great, Pastor, about the glory of God. Our country is messed up. My life is messed up. I don't just need some glowing back to go by me. I need my life to be changed. I need God to show up and do something. And if he's real, why hasn't he changed what's going on in our country? Why, why isn't he redirecting things in, in the breakdown of morality around us? Why isn't he doing something different? 
Let me tell you something. God shows up and the change begins in us. And if the church doesn't change, this country will never go in a good direction. Never. I've told this story before, but I'm going to tell it again because it, it, God put it on my heart. I worked as a chaplain at UCLA for about a year and a half, right out of seminary. And it was, a, it was an interesting place. And I worked in the children's hospital, and I, I dealt with a lot of difficult situations, not the level the parents did, but as a chaplain, because at least once a week a child died. And they would always call me when I was on, and I would go, because that was my unit. They have their own hospital now. Uh, Mattel, the toy maker, donated a bunch of money to the, they built a new children's hospital. But um, I would go over there, and one day I went over, and there was a mom. And uh, her daughter, I had been visiting her, because her daughter was dying for a period of time, four years old. And she died, and they called me. And I went in there, and she was, mom was still holding this little girl, her body. And that was often the case. I got there right after she died. And uh, the mom was just weeping. I mean, any other one in here that's ever lost a child, I haven't. But if you're around somebody that has, it's just heartbreaking. So she's holding her little girl. I never saw the dad, and I was there a bunch of hours, so I don't know where he was. But the mom was weeping for like an hour. And we had that permission, uh, something like that, to just spend a bunch of time. So I just stayed there. And for about an hour, I prayed, and I just, I just was with her, and she was weeping, and like uncontrollably, I was crying too, because I just, I couldn't do anything else. I didn't know what else to do. And about an hour in, she just stopped crying. And I thought maybe, you know, because sometimes you just cry it all out, you have no more tears left. But she started smiling. And I was kind of taken back by it, and I, I kind of just was staring at her, trying to figure out what to do. And she looks at me, I'll never forget. She looks at me and she says this. She says, do you know what it's like? I remember, because I shook my head. I said, no. I don't know. She said, and some of you have heard me give this before, this image. She said, it's like I'm in a river. This whole time, she's still holding her little girl, her body. She says, it's like I'm in a river, and it's pushing me downstream, and the, it's flowing over my head, and I'm, and I'm going to go under. I was like, yeah, I, I can imagine. She said, then it's like I reach over, and I feel a rock. And I grab hold of it, and I climb up on top of that rock. And the river is still rushing, but that rock is stable. She said, and that rock is Jesus. It was like a super powerful moment in my life. You know what I did from that point on? Every time a mom lost a child, I put them in contact with this lady because she could share the gospel in a way that I never could. Some of you are going through stuff right now. Some of you have lost loved ones. Some of you that are watching online, I know, have lost loved ones. And you feel like, where is the rock? Because I'm getting pushed under. He's right there. And he's stable. And he's secure. And he will never be moved. Amen. The rock is the key. I'm going to invite you to stand. I got two quick things to read and we'll pray. We're going to sing part of this in a second, but I want you to see the words in front of you. Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flowed be of sin the double cure. Save from wrath and make me pure. While I draw this fleeting breath, when my eyes shall close in death, when I rise to worlds unknown and behold thee on thy throne, rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. He only, Psalm 62, is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. 
In God, my salvation and my glory, the rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. The world today is getting sucked under, pushed downstream. Our country is in a bad way. But let me tell you something. Jesus Christ is secure. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would draw us, draw me to a place of repentance, Lord. Lord, our country, we cry out on behalf of our country. Lord, we cry out on behalf of our church. We cry out on behalf of our family. And Lord, we say we are not worthy because of our sin, but we claim your grace like Moses did. Lord, we choose to be set apart in worship and in prayer. Lord, we choose to pursue your presence more than anything else. We choose, Lord, to find refuge, not just on the rock, but in the cleft of the rock. There is no other way, Lord. We want more of you, Lord. I pray we would be like my dog and we would hound you, Lord, but you want to be found. We would pursue you, Lord, and we would have an intimate relationship with you that changes us from the inside out. Lord, I pray if there's anybody in here who does not know you as Lord and Savior personally today, that they would be hidden in Christ today, hidden in the rock. That you would cover them. And Lord, those of us who've been wandering around saying we want your presence, Lord, we would stand on the rock, humble ourselves, and pursue you, set apart for you. Do it all you can do, I pray, Lord. Change us. And Lord, I believe it with all my heart that, Lord, if we allow you to revive us from the inside out, Lord, this church will change this community. And this community will change this state. And this state will change this country. And this country will change the world, Lord. It's not far-fetched. Twelve men turn the world upside down. There's a lot more than 12 men and women in here, Lord. And I pray we would allow you to have more of us. We would decrease so you can increase, Lord. Make us ready for revival, I pray. In Jesus' name.